Last year, that famous monument Stonehenge was featured in the news several times because of research into the origins of its altar stone. Much to everyone's surprise, it was discovered that this particular megalith had arrived on the Salisbury Plain from Scotland. Transporting megaliths is a tricky job at the best of times, but four and a half thousand years ago, moving something that large over 750 kilometers must have been quite a project. So the obvious questions have arisen. Who did it, why, and how? A new paper published in the journal Archaeology International gets into this and has some startling suggestions. Let's take a look at the altar stone story so far. Stonehenge is an awe-inspiring prehistoric monument in the south of England that was built in several phases over many hundreds of years, starting in the Neolithic but continuing well into the Bronze Age. Evidence for an earlier timber alignment nearby dating to the Mesolithic has also been found, so this particular area must have been important to multiple generations of the same community. Stonehenge was not isolated but was part of a sacred landscape made up of other stone circles, cursus monuments, megalithic graves and henges, together with settlements where the ancient inhabitants of the region lived. Although scholars don't know exactly what Stonehenge's function was, it's thought to have been built especially for rituals. Its astronomical alignments were likely intentional and probably played a role in whatever ceremonies were carried out there. Excluding the altar stone, the megaliths that make up Stonehenge are broadly split into two categories, the sarsens that were sourced 24 kilometers away and the bluestones that originated more than 200 kilometers away in Wales. The sarsens are a silcrete or hard sandstone and make up the lintelled uprights, the inner horseshoe of five trilithons, the heel stone, the slaughter stone and the station stones. In contrast, the blue stones are actually a variety of rocks including dolerite, rhyolite, andesite and dacite and all originate from the Fishguard volcanic group in Wales. They make up the outer bluestone circle and the inner bluestone horseshoe. There's been a lot of debate as to how these bluestones reached the Salisbury Plain where Stonehenge is located. The general consensus is that they were transported by people either over land or by land and water and that they may have formed part of a different stone circle in Wales before. However, there are also scholars who think that the bluestones were glacial erratics. One scholar in particular, Brian John, has been quite vocal about this. Although there's little evidence to support the bluestones having travelled that route as glacial erratics during the last glacial period, John still thinks it's possible that they were erratics just at a much earlier time during the Anglian stage glaciation more than 424,000 years ago. If the bluestones were transported anthropogenically, then it's quite an unusual example from the ancient world since megaliths were mostly sourced local to where the monuments were built or if they were sourced at a distance, it wasn't as far as 200 kilometers. The recumbent altar stone at Stonehenge is labeled as Stone 80 and is 4.9 meters long, 1 meter wide and 0.5 meters thick. It's a gray-green micaceous sandstone, is estimated to weigh 6 tons and is located in the southwestern part of Stonehenge's center. The altar stone is pinned by a fallen upright of the great trilithon and sits next to that trilithon's fallen lintel. It's possible that it may have stood upright originally before falling into its current position. However, since its long sides are roughly aligned with the midwinter sunrise, it's more likely that it was placed lying down intentionally. Until recently, for around 100 years, experts grouped the altar stone together with the blue stones and supported an origin for it in the old red sandstone sequences of South Wales. However, in 2019, scholars started to question this, and what ensued 
pursued over the next few years was a comprehensive analysis of samples of the altar stone to assess its chemical and mineralogical makeup. A range of techniques, mostly non-invasive, were used, and by 2022, scholars had determined the key characteristics of the altar stone, such as its abundant mica, its early formed pore-filling barite, and its kaolinite cement. Their familiarity with the old red sandstone sequences in Wales led them to suggest that this was not the origin of the altar stone. However, no other source could be suggested at that time. In 2023, a paper published in the Journal of Archaeological Science Reports outlined further research into this subject. Analyses were carried out on old red sandstone samples in Wales, the Welsh borderland, the West Midlands and Somerset to see if matches between these and the altar stone could be found. The team were able to rule out the old red sandstone of the Anglo-Welsh basin as a source for the altar stone. This was mostly sent on its barite content, a highly insoluble mineral which is found to be abundant in the altar stone compared to the levels within the old red sandstone. Based on the dimensions of the altar stone, they also suggested that the geometry of the original bed must have been tabular rather than that of channelized or lenticular form, and the lack of trace fossils must mean it came from a non-marine depositional setting. They also saw no signs of tectonism in its sediment characteristics, so suggested that it was from a source that's post-Caledonian, non-marine Devonian or post-Devonian. The authors of the paper concluded that a wider geographic area and different stratigraphy should be considered for further research into the origin of the altar stone, and said that they would move their focus to the old red sandstone of the Midland Valley and Orcadian basins in Scotland, as well as the Permian Triassic of Northern England. In August of last Last year, a paper was published in the journal Nature confirming that the trace element isotopic data in two fragments of the altar stone was a match for the Orcadian Basin in northeastern Scotland. The authors of the paper suggest that the altar stone was transported anthropogenically rather than as a glacial erratic, since ice sheet reconstructions show a northwards movement of glaciers from the Grampian Mountains towards the Orcadian Basin during previous Pleistocene glaciations. They also point out there's little evidence for glacial deposition in central southern than Britain. That people travelled extensively in the Neolithic is also evidenced by the fact that the common vole was introduced to Orkney from continental Europe and a grinding tool was found in Dorset that had originated in Normandy. The Hansen log boat dating to 1500 BCE also shows that prehistoric groups were capable of moving shaped sandstone blocks along rivers, and similar cultural motifs and construction techniques appear in Orkney, Ireland and southern England. So there's no reason why ancient groups could not have transported the altar stone in some way or another from Scotland to the Salisbury Plain, although it would still have been a difficult and labour-intensive undertaking. In October 2024, a paper was published in the Journal of Archaeological Science Reports on research carried out in Orkney to further pinpoint the source of the altar stone. By this point, experts were fairly certain that it had come from the Orcadian Basin, but that's a large geological area encompassing the islands that make up Orkney, as well as the mainland of northeast Scotland and the Shetland Isles. Considering the potential links between Neolithic communities, they hypothesised that the altar stone's origin was likely the same as the megaliths used to build two famous stone circles on Orkney, the Stones of Stenness and the Ring of Broggar. The researchers carried out mineralogical and geochemical investigations of these two stone circles as well as the stratigraphic horizons of mainland Orkney and concluded that they do not have the same source as the altar stone. This was mainly gleaned from the lack of barite mentioned earlier as being present in large amounts in the altar stone and the abundance of detrial cave feldspar which is low in the altar stone. Therefore even though the altar stone was likely sourced from the Orcadian basin it did not originate in the part of the basin found on mainland Orkney. Further research will concentrate on northeast mainland Scotland and the Shetland Isles to see if the altar stone's true origin can be determined. So now we have this interesting dilemma. 
the builders of Stonehenge not only sourced some of their material from over 200 kilometers away in Wales, but also from more than 750 kilometers away in Scotland. It's not such a crazy idea when you consider that the Neolithic people did travel both overland and water, that they were capable of transporting and erecting large megaliths, and that there do appear to be some cultural connections between Neolithic groups. However, further analysis of the evidence was needed to get into the details of who, why, and how. A new paper published in the journal Archaeology International discusses this. As mentioned before, the majority of Neolithic monuments were built using locally sourced stones. Many of these were so immense in size and weight that transporting them and placing them was still a massive achievement. However, from the beginning of the 4th millennium BC, there are several examples of composite monuments where megalithic tombs were built using materials from different sources, some of which had been transported over relatively long distances. For example, Newgrange and Nauth in Ireland were built using megaliths from six different source areas as far away as 40 kilometers to the north and 40 kilometers to the south. Also more pertinent to this discussion is that something similar has been observed at recumbent stone circles in Scotland. Recumbent stone circles, that is stone circles that incorporate a large block or slab laying horizontal amongst the otherwise upright megaliths, are found in northeast Scotland. They are particularly common in what is today Aberdeenshire. Often the recumbent stone is propped up on its side by upright megaliths or packing stones. Interestingly, the monoliths in such circles are graded in height. These recumbent stone circles may have been aligned with the moon, but are also aligned with the solar arc at midwinter. Much analysis of these monuments has drawn the conclusion that they were erected in several phases, with the stone circle, recumbent stone and whatever uprights held it in place, being a later phase, with the latter potentially positioned to shut off an entrance. The recumbent stone was usually made of a material that differs from the surrounding monoliths, just as is the case with the altar stone at Stonehenge. So why might these monuments have incorporated materials from lots of different locations in spite of the distances and effort required to transport them? Could there have been a relationship between communities from different geographic locations that was embodied in the erection of stone monuments? During the Neolithic, the earliest examples of a particular kind of decorated pottery known as grooved ware because of its design have been found in Orkney. This pottery has also been found at Stonehenge, but dates to a later period. The distribution of grooved ware pottery implies a connection between the north and the south, and it's not the only evidence for this. Classic henge monuments, where there is an inner circular ditch surrounded by an outer bank, are found throughout Britain, but the earliest example is part of the Stones of Stenness monument in Orkney. There's also a strong similarity between the layout of late Neolithic houses at Scarra Bray in Orkney and those at the Durrington Walls settlement near Stonehenge. Henge. There are some differences. For example, at Scarra Bray, the houses are made of stone, and at Durrington Walls, they were made of wood and plaster. Hearths at the former are square and made of flagstones, whereas at the latter, they were circular and made of chalk plaster. But overall, the similarity between them is incredible. House 851 at Durrington Walls has a comparable floor plan to Hut 7 at Scarra Bray. House 851 measures 4.8 by 5.2 meters, which is close to the size of Hut 7. Both houses have a doorway opposite the dresser, two beds against the side walls, with the shorter bed being next to the left wall as viewed from the entrance. And both houses are squarish with rounded corners. There are also strong similarities between smaller ancillary structures that were probably used for storage. So what does this mean? Perhaps cultural ideas spread from the north across Britain, eventually reaching the south. However, this doesn't appear to be the case. Many other late Neolithic houses in Britain are quite different to those at Scarra Bray and Durrington Walls. This would imply a direct connection between the communities close to Stonehenge and those 750 kilometers away in Orkney. So perhaps the altar stone was given as a gift by people from northern Scotland to those at Stonehenge to cement a line Sciences or to imbue the monument with some sort of spiritual properties. Megaliths clearly had importance to Neolithic and Bronze Age people, and it's quite possible 
that the altar stone derived from a dramatic location just as the blue stones did, a location whose geology stood out in the landscape, making the megalith seem even more magical. It could also be that in laying the stone horizontally, it was meant to resemble the recumbent stone circle tradition of northeastern Scotland, thereby bringing two cultures together. The authors of the paper suggest that the transportation of the altar stone likely took place over land, perhaps accompanied by events of celebration and feasting along the way. It's also possible it was a glacial erratic that was discovered somewhere in Scotland, not necessarily close to its original source, and then moved from there. Perhaps as a result of that, it stood out in the landscape and appeared special. Based on what's known about late Neolithic and Bronze Age boats, it's unlikely they would have been sturdy enough to support the transport of the altar stone by rivers or the sea. The authors of the paper think that the altar stone may have been transported on a wooden sledge via wooden rails that were reused over and over again for segments of the journey. This would have meant a transportation time of roughly eight months. I think this idea is pretty wild. Clearly, there were many connections between communities in the ancient world. Certainly, some ideas spread through cultural exchange, but many others spread via the movement of people. As I mentioned, there are several examples of monuments sourcing their building materials from multiple locations, and it's possible to imagine lots of reasons why they did that. Contributions from different communities, perceived spiritual characteristics at particular locations, or a sort of Neolithic trade network. Network. But Stonehenge is unique in terms of the distances involved. Plus, although Stonehenge is undoubtedly a magnificent monument and would have stood out in all its different forms during the time it was in use, there are many other incredible megalithic and earthen monuments in Britain and Ireland. It's not as if Stonehenge was the largest. So what about all the others? What was it about the Salisbury Plain that made people travel all the way there from Orkney with a big chunk of stone? Let me know what you think in the comments. I'm intrigued to hear your opinions on this one. That's it. Please hit the like button if you didn't already. Thank you very much to my patrons and channel members and I'll see you next time.